Hello, everyone. Good evening. Welcome to the Desert Laboratory. Uh, my name is Ben Wilder, and I'm the director here. So, well, we're really, um, really glad you're all here. There's um, a lot to talk about. And I'll, uh, maybe I'll start with that uh, we're going to have a new road pretty soon. So. <laughs> After a lot of effort, um, anyway, we're, we're going to be starting next Tuesday. The road's going to be closed for repaving for about two weeks, uh, opening up. They keep telling me it's only going to be two weeks. Um, we'll see. But February 3rd is the plan. And so we've got, as part of that, we've started a Friends of Tuma Moth program, which is a way to, um, well, to help all of those, all of you that love and care about this place, to uh, kind of, to we can better interact with and be stewards of the site. So we have a crowdfunding campaign going right now. We're um, over 70% of the way there. We're only about 11, 12 days in. Awesome. Uh, and that's in large part thanks to many of you who are in the room. And so every dollar is continuing to be matched, uh, dollar for dollar, until we meet our goal. So uh, let's do it. Let's get there. The, um, I really want to spend some kind of tell you uh, why we're um, doing this lecture series. Sorry, it's an article in the paper today said, uh, talking about a, a, a marine mammal in the Gulf of California at two o'clock is not as random as you think. <laughs> and, and it really boils down to, we're not talking about this issue enough. Uh, the, the vaquita is, as I was kind of describing to someone today, it's like, it's our corpus. Our marine mammal. This is of the desert. I mean, it's a microendemic species, right in the upper Gulf of California, that that it, it adapted to and evolved in the truly arid desert sea that is the Gulf of California, and that in itself is beautiful. Um, what's happening now? What's been happening for decades, and what we're really going to dig into in this lecture series is. Well, it's the future, honestly. Uh, the conservation is not easy. And I think everything with the vaquita is so critical right now. And um, it's just all at the surface, all the different forces at play. Uh, black markets, uh, economic incentives um, from China for the swim bladder of the totuaba, another endemic species, uh, the fishing of which catches the vaquita and gill nets but the price for the swim bladder of the totoaba is higher than cocaine on markets. Um, conservation is stuck in the middle with when looking at the social, at the uh, livelihoods of fishermen from these communities in the region. Um, nothing is easy and so much has been tried and, and we're gonna be hearing from really the, the people at the core of this story um, that have been trying for decades. And, and, and Barb, thank you for being here and taking the time really that you're here. And we're going to have a number of wonderful people as part of this. But I guess it's just, um, this is not easy. Uh, and, and this is really controversial. There's so many different angles at this topic. And that's OK. And conservation is not easy. The Anthropocene, our future is not easy. But we have to talk about this. We have to come together. And we need to ask questions. I mean. As conservation, as a scientist, I need to continue to ask myself the question, how are we approaching? Are we doing the right things? Are we collaborating enough? Are we addressing this from the right angles? And if not, we need to, to look at that. And I think everything that's happening with the Vaquita right now gives us an amazing opportunity to, to look at that and to reassess and to learn. Because if we don't learn, this I mean, this is just the beginning, um, yeah, unfortunately. And so there's a lot to take away here. And that's what we're going to be digging in um, these next uh, tonight and for other lectures. So thank you for being here. I think it's gonna it's, it's not gonna be easy, but it's gonna be really educational. And I um, I look forward to seeing where we get to. And it, the situation itself on the ground from where we are tonight could be dramatically different in May. It's such a volatile issue. So thank you for being here. And I really am glad to introduce Peggy Boyer, the director of SEDO, who we're just honored to be part of this. Great honor to be uh, sharing this uh, this venue with Ben here on Tumamak Hill. Uh, Sado has uh, uh, is the Center for Study of Deserts and Oceans, as um, most of you know, 
is, is this year celebrating 40 years working in the uh, northern Gulf of California. <laughs> Event sort of launches launches a, a series of activities that we'll be uh, 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 sponsoring during this this uh, anniversary year, uh, and it's uh, quite fitting that we start with this lecture series on Paquita from uh, the day that we opened our doors in Puerto Penasco. Uh, the Paquita has been a beacon uh, for all of our work uh, with communities, with fishermen, uh, with uh, endangered species. So it's, uh, we've been following the story, we've participated and, and uh, have been interacting with the players, trying to move forward uh, for the for Baquita and, and respecting the communities in the region. And so uh, we, in the series, we've brought a, a, a very interesting lineup of people that can speak to the issues so, so that this community can also learn some of the most recent things that are happening and have been said that will continue to evolve over the next few months because it is a very critical time. And we're very interested in hearing from you ideas because uh, uh, we're desperate. So uh, this, through this series, we'll not, we'll not, only, we'll not only hear about, uh, you know, we, we may or may not save Vaquita, but it's not just about saving Vaquita, as you'll learn. It's about learning how to coexist with marine mammals and other species in our oceans. And so uh, whatever le lessons we're, we're learning, uh, we will be using those throughout the world. Uh, and and this, is, this is what we have to do in conservation today, is, uh, is learn whatever we can and apply it while we can. So without further ado, uh, uh, like I said, we have a, a, a fine lineup of people. And we're able to sponsor these people uh, uh, through uh, the generosity of Sado's membership and, and uh, sponsors. And uh, we have a number of uh, items that, uh, that depict Paquita and things for sale that we will be uh, 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 displaying here uh, at each of these events. And those, the proceeds for those sales will go to help us uh, bring these speakers to, uh, to the venue. So we appreciate anything you can do to uh, contribute to that effort. Uh, so our first speaker here, I'm very honored to introduce. Um, uh, someone called her tonight that she was the Vaquita goddess. <laughs> and she said, she said she's not exactly a very good goddess because she doesn't have any powers. <laughs> but she certainly has the, uh, the wardrobe. She's got the beautiful jewelry that she, that she has created uh, that uh, depict Vaquita. So uh, uh, Barb uh, is here tonight as a, a representative of CIRVA, the committee, the International Committee for the Recuperation of Maquita. Uh, she also has a position in the genetics program of the Southwest Fisheries uh, Institute of NOAA, but because they are furloughed, she's not here on official duty. Uh, on official <laughs> duty. Oh, no. um, She's uh, been involved in marine mammal research for the last 30 years and is uh, predominantly in conservation issues. And she's the, the preeminent uh, uh, population biologist for Baquita in the United States. Uh, so uh, Barbara brings with her vast experience uh, and uh, work at all levels on Baquita and, and she'll be sharing her perspectives with us tonight. Thank you, Barbara. Thank you. Well, it's a pleasure to be here, and just to get to see that sunset, it was awesome. And so I really enjoy, you know, being able to communicate what I know about the Kitas, and I'm going to take quite a, a number of versions and talk about conservation in general and what we can learn about uh, the Kitas and our sort of future efforts uh, for uh, conservation. So I'm going to start out with something that you probably don't hear about too much here in the desert, and that's a little bit of marine mammal conservation history. Um, talk about how we developed recipes for success, what we did basically in the last century, and then evaluate how that's working for us in this century, which is a very different time. And learn how we can take some lessons from terrestrial species um, and hopefully uh, use those to our benefit to help us uh, deal with the marine world 
um, where we're dealing um, <clears throat> with a lot of the same issues, um, and in some cases, we're a little bit behind where the terrestrial biologists have gotten already. So my introduction to marine mammals um, actually was uh, back in the 1970s, um, when industrial whaling uh, was still going on. <clears throat> and what you see in the graph is the sequential de depletion of all of the great whales, humpbacks, blue whales, fin whales. <clears throat> and there were over 2 million whales that were killed in the Antarctic and in the North Pacific. Um, over 200,000 whales were killed. And it was one of the things that really pushed forward two of the major pieces of legislation um, that have influenced my entire career. Um, in 1972, the <coughs> Marine Mammal Protection Act was passed, and in 1973, the Endangered Species Act uh, was passed. And a lot of us forget what it was actually like in that era when those acts were actually passed. <clears throat> In addition to the whales, another thing that really pushed um, the legislation for marine mammals was the tuna dolphin issue. And I think it's sort of shocking to people to know how much uh, of a, actually a bigger issue it was for those dolphins than the commercial whaling was. In 1972 alone, 368,600 dolphins were killed by U.S. fishermen. So that's a pretty big deal in one single year. Um, and so they passed the Marine Mammal Protection Act, and I think one of the things that we also forget is how long it takes for conservation to actually take effect. So they passed the act in 1972. Congress expected the whole problem would be solved in a few years. Um, the industry came to the U.S. government and asked for a quota. And the government set a quota of 50 to 110,000 dolphins a year. Um, and they were immediately sued by the NGOs. It went to court, and uh, Judge Ritchie came out with a very important decision that basically said, unless you can prove no harm, you have no business in granting a permit to the tuna industry, which was hugely in influential. It reversed burden of proof. It had an enormous influence effect on the industry. And what happened is you can see the deaths of dolphins came down, but then there were unintended consequences. The, the U.S. Uh, tuna fleet basically changed its flags over and there was no more U.S. tuna fleet. Um, it switched over to being a, a, a completely uh, other countries <clears throat> that, that took over the tuna industry. And you can see the number of dolphin deaths going up again. So the Marine Mammal Protection Act actually wasn't helping anymore because it wasn't a U.S. fishery. And then this guy came along, Sam Labuddy. He went undercover. He took films of these dolphins being hauled live up in the nets and killed while they were alive in these big tuna blocks that were pulling the nets up. And it was broadcast on national television. And there was a huge controversy. Um, Starkist came out and negotiated with uh, Sam LaBuddy and his NGO uh, folks to come up with the Dolphin Safe Tuna label that you still see on tuna cans today. And it was after the tuna companies took the progressive step of saying that they weren't going to buy tuna that was fished in that way that the U.S. government then wrote it into the Marine Mammal Protection Act later. <clears throat> but, you know, it was a really interesting story, because you can see a lot of times passed since 1982. And in fact, over 2 million dolphins were killed by tuna fishermen in the 22 years after the Marine Mammal Protection Act was passed. So it likely saved millions of dolphins' lives, but it still really told you it took 22 years. Um, and that was with one, um, relatively straightforward industry to deal with. And most conservation issues are much more difficult than that. Um, another thing that I was involved in early in my career, that's me as a 20-something year old. <laughs> I worked out on the ice with the Eskimos, um, doing the initial work and counting, figuring out how many bowhead whales they, there were. And whales were listed as an endangered species under the Endangered Species Act. The U.S. belongs to the International Whaling Commission and was under a lot of pressure because they were allowing uh, the Eskimos to whale an endangered species. 
Um, and this was just an amazingly successful uh, conservation effort because, of course, the Eskimos didn't have any interest in wiping out their own whales. And their, I mean, it's part of their cultural tradition. And so they formed, in response to this, the Alaska Eskimo Whaling Commission. They regulated their own hunt. Um, they report every year to the International Whaling Commission. And today, over half of the whales that are out there swimming were born since I was a 20-year-old out there on the ice. So it's a tremendous success story that sh can show what happens if the people who are using the resource have a, a reason to go out there and <coughs> conservation. So what made these laws and rules effective? Well, there were a lot of things that had to come together. There was governmental will fueled by public support. There were empowered implementers. There was enforcement, or at least a fear of enforcement. Uh, there was data that, to drive the management. There were NGOs and courts that checked the implementation. There were well-educated and concerned public. And there were conservation issues that could be solved through regulatory mechanisms. And as we'll see, that isn't always the case. Um, but when you have all, it takes all of these things coming together before you can really get a good outcome. And it takes a lot of time to make that happen. <clears throat> the other thing that's really different between when I started in this business and today is that the past conservation successes were really in a pre-digital era. I mean, everybody watched, or not everybody, but people all over the world watched the first human steps on, on the moon. And there was a much more uh, easier way to reach a large public with a single message. <clears throat> Today, we're at one time more connected, and at one time way less connected. It's really difficult to get people's attention even when it's a really urgent issue. And I think that's something that conservationists still have not um, successfully come to terms with. So the last historical um, example I'm going to talk about is this animal, the Baiji, or the Yangtze River Dolphin. Um, this particular individual is named Chi Chi. Um, Chi Chi, you can see that scar, uh, was actually caught in rolling hooks uh, that are set by um, small-time fishermen on the Yangtze. They turned this individual lip into the research institute, and it lived there for 22 years. And basically, most of what we know about the species comes from this single individual. <clears throat> The population was declining, uh, much in the way that you'll see uh, Vaquita. It follows basically the same trajectory. And there were a whole laundry list of causes um, that were listed for uh, by G. An increase in shipping traffic, um, collisions, noise pollution, water pollution. Um, but by far, the biggest killer um, was incidental mortality in fishing gear on these little uh, mom and pop operations. So I went out um, with this crew in 2006 um, on these two vessels to try to find the last of the Baiji and be able to take them into these uh, reserves um, where the animals could be protected. And this is what we saw in Yangtze. It was a shocking experience um, to see uh, what the habitat uh, had become. Um, we had our two boats. We were on the water for 39 days. We covered uh, over 3,000 miles with both visual and acoustic efforts, um, covered the whole range of the species four times, um, and sadly, we did not see a single baiji, we did not hear a single whistle, and we had to conclude that the species that had been here for over 30 million years on planet Earth was extinct. And that was rough. So we came back to the vaquita, which now became the most critically endangered marine mammal in the world, and said, we, we can't do this. We have to do something different. So <clears throat> now I'm going to talk to you about the whole trajectory and history of vaquitas. So you all know where it lives. It lives in this tiny little distribution. We looked at the genetics and found out that it's a species that probably always has been naturally rare. And so it is very vulnerable to extinction, just by those two factors alone. Not very many of them live right next to very productive fishing areas. 
and they have a teeny tiny distribution. And in fact, they were only described just over uh, 50 years ago based on a skull that was found on the beach. The other thing that was of concern was that they were commonly seen dead in fishing nets. And given this natural rarity, um, Lorenzo Rojas Bracho, who will be talking later in the series, and I wrote a paper in 1999 and examined the most important threats to the species. We looked at pollutants. Um, we did work on the blubber and found that they actually had the cleanest blubber of any marine mammal on planet Earth, and that still holds true today. Um, what we do you looked mean at by the cleanest blubber. They um, had. They they didn't have any heavy metals or any pollutants. No DDT. No PCBs. They were just nice, clean what you would expect better than the Antarctic, which was really surprising. Um, but a lot of that actually has to do with the next topic, the lack of the Colorado River flow. So there's not a lot of agricultural runoff that comes in. I mean, it's a desert porpoise. You know, it lives in this relatively pristine environment from a marine uh, perspective. And because there was uh, no uh, Colorado River flow, there was concern about whether the habitat had changed and whether they might be at risk from the habitat. But there have been now over uh, almost 70 vaquitas that they've examined that have been killed in fishing nets. And so you can examine their <clears throat> genetics, you can examine what the animals look like, and they've all been fat. We've never seen a skinny vaquita. Um, and we always, when we went out and did surveys, would see lots of calves. Um, and of course, the number of vaquitas, especially now, is way down. So, there's really no indication that their habitat is a problem for them. And in fact, we published a recent paper on that, examining more about the Colorado River uh, issue, if you want to take a look at that. Then the remaining uh, threat was the one that we were concerned about right to begin with, and that is uh, entanglement in gillnets. And there were Roughly a thousand pongas in the two uh, adjacent fishing villages of El Golpe de Santa Clara and San Felipe. <clears throat> there was a study that was done by Caterina de Grossa in between 1993 and 1995, and uh, she estimated that about 78 vaquitas were being killed annually <clears throat> and that they were killed in all types of gill nets. But we didn't know how many vaquitas they were, there were, and we knew a fair amount about their biology by actually doing the necropsies. So we knew that um, they, well, we thought, you'll see if this has changed very recently, that they could have calves about every two years. And basically, um, we didn't know how many there were. And that was a pretty critical piece of information. So this is a. This I'll just try to speak loudly. So this is uh, some footage that was taken of Vaquita in 2008. It's still the best footage of Vaquitas. And they are really <laughs> difficult to survey. Um, they're about my size. They're 5 foot 2 and 120 pounds. <laughs> so they are the smallest of, of the marine uh, cetaceans. That's a dolphin or a porpoise. And they, uh, their, clear, their nearest relative actually lives in Peru, the Burmeister's porpoise. They were isolated up in uh, the Gulf of California about three to three and a half million years ago. So they've been there a long time. Um, and <clears throat> they just, if you look really closely, you'll be able to see the dorsal fin wiggling. They've got that big, tall dorsal fin. Um, much taller than most porpoises their size, and they've got these pretty big flippers with six fingers, um, which is a unique thing, probably to dissipate heat, because they're the only porpoise in the world that lives in waters like this, <clears throat> which are really hot for a porpoise, but they're really special because it's super productive, and that's exactly what porpoises like. So when we went out there, we had to try to see these. I mean, the dorsal fin is like that big. And they only show up in pairs, um, and not usually more than that. And they avoid vessels. 
And so we had to figure out how to survey them. So we used these big binoculars, the 25 power binoculars, with a normal school of dolphins. We can see them four miles away. With vaquitas, we usually see them maybe a mile because they're only two. <laughs> Not a whole school of jumping ones. Um, you can see we have those big eyes arrayed all the way across the top of the ship. <clears throat> and we have a, a group of real top observers that uh, function on those big eyes to be able to spot the animals before they start uh, avoiding the ship. And they do avoid uh, ship noise. And it's one of the reasons that a lot of the fishermen have never seen a live vaquita. In fact, they call them phantasmas because they see them dead in their nets, but they never see the live ones. And it's because they generally move away from boats, which is a good thing for them. But it makes the surveying very difficult. So in 1997, we estimated there were about 600 vaquitas. Um, and given what we knew about biology, the 78 deaths was clearly not sustainable. Uh, by that population. So after the extinction of the Baiji, when we came back with a renewed dedication to try to do something for the Kitas, we did another survey in 2008, and we estimated that there were only 200 Bakitas uh, in 2008. <clears throat> and that was consistent with what we were predicting from the number of nets, the rate of bycatch, which is the accidental entanglement and death um, in the nets um, and <clears throat> so we that it's a, basically what we expected to see and all of that resulted from uh, what I call legal gill netting in other words they were fisheries that were permitted like shrimp and, and thin fish um, but very frequently done in an illegal manner um, for example, the shrimp gill net should have been 200 meter long, and the typical gill net was about 1,000 to 1,200 meters, and they're supposed to use one, and they used two. So they were basically using 10 times the amount of net that was allowed on their permits. <clears throat> we also developed a new method to be able to uh, monitor every single year what was happening with the Kitas. Um, one of the things that was really disturbing about the Baiji is that they went extinct when no one was looking. And we didn't want that to happen. But those surveys are really expensive with the big ship. And we wanted a method that we could follow what was happening every single year. Plus, Mexico had just put in this Paquita refuge, which you can see very faintly outlined, that funny little <coughs> polygon with all the circles in it. <clears throat> and the hope of the Mexican government was that the, by protecting from fishing 50% of the distribution of Paquitas, that that was going to be enough and Paquitas were going to start recovering. And they wanted a program to be able to show that. So we tested out a bunch of acoustic uh, devices. And the winner was that one with the yellow arrow. It's called a C-Pod. It's uh, passive acoustic detectors. Uh, the key does echolocate like bats, only about 10 times higher. That's how they find their food in that turbid, productive water. Um, and because they do that all the time, we can pick up those echolocation clicks on this device. So we designed this grid to be able to uh, monitor what we hoped would be a 4% per year recovery. And we put it out there. We get about 3,000 days of data a year from these devices, which gives us a lot more statistical power to tell what's going on with this rare cryptic species than we could by going out and doing visual surveys. <clears throat> and sadly, um, we got quite a shock. So we had documented this continuous decline due to bycatch in, in gill nets for shrimp and finfish was about 8% per year, which is already pretty bad. But since about 2011, um, there has been this uh, resumption of an illegal fishery for Totuaba. And what the acoustic monitoring showed was a decline of over 40% per year. Um, which was shocking. Um, and this, the resumption of this fishery was uh, uh, pushed by a, a very lucrative
lucrative market um, in China for Totoaba swim, swim bladders or food chains. Um, and these, these can fetch tens of thousands of dollars for one of these swim bladders. Um, and so it's, it's an irresistible lure to fishermen. And there you can see a Bikita, a Bikita down on the net and a Totoaba, actually a pretty little Totoaba, being held up. And you can see why, even though all gill nets are lethal for um, vaquitas, the deadliest is the Totoaba gill net because they're those big mesh. You can see on the right there, the big mesh um, is just the size for a vaquita to stick their head into. So they're, they're particularly bad. But because we were able to uh, detect this illegal activity and the effect that it had on vaquitas very rapidly, um, we took it to the Mexican government, and uh, President Enrique Nieto came to San Felipe in 2015 and announced their four-part plan to save Mexico's porpoise. To increase enforcement, to ban gill nets for two years within the range of vaquitas, to compensate fishermen, and to accelerate alternative gear research and socialization. And let me spend a little bit of time explaining that uh, figure there. So the Bikita Refuge, which is that no fishing zone, is that part that is outlined in blue. Um, the yellow hatched area um, is actually the distribution of Bikitas. And you can see that the, the plume basically from the, the tides basically pulling up the mud from the Colorado River Delta is the area that Bikitas love the most. They love that turbid, productive water. And so the uh, government of Mexico put in that um, red line as a gill net exclusion zone, not because that was completely ruled by the cheetah, but because it was the easiest to enforce. So it was a compromise between where the vaquitas went in terms of east and west and where fishermen could easily look and see whether they were inside or outside some fairly easy, you know, on, on east or west of this line or north or south of this line. So that was what was set in place um, and they put the Navy um, in, in control of enforcement and, and the hopes were pinned on, on uh, actually uh, closing down the uh, Totoaba market. <coughs> But at the same time, they asked us to go out and do another big visual survey. So we went out again in 2015, and then we found that indeed the acoustic monitoring was telling us the story correctly, and there were only about 60 vaquitas left. <clears throat> but there were some hope, uh, some good news that came out of that. This is the uh, a photograph taken of the uh, radar screen on our ship and what you're seeing of uh, the, the little uh, bright dots um, are actually all pongas and the bright orange is the boundary to the Bikita refuge so you can literally see the outline of the Bikita refuge in nets and each one of those little dots had 2,000 meters of net out so there was like a spider web of nets going around the Bikita refuge and this is when it was being actively enforced. Uh, and so it, it wasn't really good news for the Bikitas because the Bikitas don't pay any attention to where the boundary is. When we went out in 2015, this is what we saw. We didn't see any gill netting, no evidence at all. The fishermen were being compensated. We thought, wow, this presidential decree is going to really make a difference. It's going gonna, it's gonna to save the Bikitas. But our survey period, when we need to have to be out there for the glassy calm water to see vaquitas, is typically in October and November. And Totoabas don't start spawning until December. So we weren't out there during Totoaba season. <clears throat> so we went back and went out on the Sea Shepherd uh, boats, and I'll show you more about that in a minute. And this is what we saw. So that's my, my husband, Jay Barlow, holding up a Totoaba net that we just dragged up. That is the anchor that was holding that net to the bottom. It's about that high, <clears throat> and it holds it permanently to the bottom. They just put the nets down, they can relocate them with GPS, drag, hook the net,
pull it up, pull the totoaba out, and drop it back down to the bottom. So they're there for three to four months, 24 hours a day. No wonder that the kias were declining at 40% per year. And the nets themselves, when you pull them up, each individual net is not that big. There, You can see one circled there where the sea shepherd is offloading the net onto the navy boat. And so they're relatively easy to get out there um, by putting it under other fishing nets. <clears throat> so I'm going to play you, I hope. This is a sea shepherd video from uh, one of their earlier seasons. So, unfortunately, between what Sea Shepherd was observing and then we did continued and we are still doing continued uh, acoustic monitoring, um, there was another big drop. Basically, we lost another 50% between 2015 and 2016. And so, Serva, the recovery team, decided that uh, we had been moving along, developing a step sort of conservative program to be able to take vaquitas into captivity while this whole crisis out there played out in their environment. <clears throat> and once we saw that we lost half of them in one year, it was like, okay, we can't afford to do a nice conservative stepwise program. We have to get out there and try to take every vaquita we can into human care as quickly as we can. So we formed a, a different group with a different level of expertise um, called the CETA CPR for Conservation Protection and Recovery. 
So now we're talking about veterinarians and engineers and you know Navy dolphins. It was it's quite a, a, a change um, in sort of conservation strategies. And in uh, 2017, we were out in the field with 90 participants from nine different countries um, to go out and try to <clears throat> find, catch, house, and care for vaquitas. Um, and we just uh, recently uh, published a, a paper that um, documents all of the efforts that went into that that's in uh, endangered uh, species research. So the first thing we had to do is we had to find them. Um, so we modified our acoustic methods so that the fishermen would go out, they would set the seed pods out in areas where we knew the vaquitas were spending time, and then they would retrieve them that night. <clears throat> so I was out on the big ship. <clears throat> I would get a WhatsApp on my phone at 3 a.m. saying, this is the data from the seed pods today, and then we you know, figure out where to go, and then I'd be back on, you know, sort of alerting the people who were in the catch team that we had to, where we had to go by four in the morning, and we were out, out the door trying to find Makita. So then it was up to the visual team uh, to not only find them, as we have in the past, but also to track them. So we used um, three different vessels uh, to be able to spot them and then keep track of them. The catch boats were sort of lingering off behind us, and we also had um, the Navy dolphins with us in case we couldn't track them visually to be able to potentially track them using uh, the U.S. Navy dolphins. <clears throat> the catch team was mainly from Denmark. Um, they had an experienced team that had developed a method to catch harbor porpoise, um, and so they were uh, flown out with all of their gear. They used these very lightweight uh, gill nets that, that float at the surface. And then we went out, we were quite a fleet um, out there of uh, all the catch teams, all the veterinarians, um, trying to find them. And of course, then we had to be prepared to take care of the animals. So we built a land facility, a Vaquita Care Center, um, that had two different uh, pools. And then we had a veterinary uh, center that was right next to that. And also we had a sea pen, which is where uh, we hoped to be able to keep the animals until we could come up with a, a sanctuary <clears throat> uh, that was a better setting for them. But this is definitely the emergency room. Um, it, this is a tuna pen that was towed from Ensenada all the way around the tip of Baja and all the way up to the top there, 1,200, well, it's well, well more than that. Anyway, they, they had to build special, special facilities to be able to care for the four vaquita. Just an amazing effort to get all of this ready in just a few months. Um, then we had to have the animal care specialists, so we had to have people who were curators, trainers. We flew in porpoise veterinarians from all over the world. <clears throat> and then we had to go out there and do it. And so um, within the first week, we caught our first vaquita. Um, it was uh, a little, uh, probably about a six month old calf. Um, it was feeding, that's right at the age of weaning, so it wasn't feeding with its mom, but there was a larger individual around that we saw it in association with. Once we started to, to chase them, they sort of came together. Um, and so we caught the calf, we didn't catch uh, what was almost certainly the mom. The care specialist said sometimes juvenile animals actually do better. They're a little bit more flexible and sometimes they don't do well at all. There's like quite a discussion. They decided, let's see how it does. We'll see how, how it does. So they took it in <clears throat> and unfortunately, it just never settled down. It was really um, stressed. Um, and they decided that the best thing to do was to take it back out to where the mom was and we were still keeping track of that individual on the ship and to release it there. So you can see our ship way in the background there <clears throat> and they um, released uh, the individual back um, into the wild and unfortunately we have no way of knowing its fate. The next individual we, we caught was sort of the ideal. It was a, a mature female, not pregnant, not lactating, no calf, 
seemed to be really calm when they held it um, in these uh, pools alongside of, of the, the catch boats. Uh, so they decided to take her into the sea pen. When they put her in the sea pen, she swam around, seemed to be figuring out that she was in an enclosed area, and then just sank to the bottom. And they went in, they pulled her up and decided to do an, an emergency release. Um, they released her. She swam, swam straight away very rapidly, did 180, and came straight back towards them. And when they caught her, she was not breathing and she had no heartbeat. They did three hours of CPR on her, but they were unable to revive her. So the capture attempts were immediately halted. Um, it was uh, <clears throat> quite a while until we actually got the results back on what happened, but she died of a heart attack. That was a result of what a uh, term that is very common in animals that are captured, all, all mammals, that's called capture myopathy, and it's basically going into shock. And they've learned how to deal with this with lots of uh, zoo animals, but with cetaceans, um, we really don't know how to deal with it because if you knock a cetacean out, their breathing is voluntary. Um, so you can't do that. So we really don't know sort of the basic things that you need to know for an animal that is susceptible to capture myopathy. And so because we didn't know how to deal with it, we decided that this was not going to be an option for taquitos. We were able to rescue the gametes um, from that female, and we have living cell cultures from uh, both of the individuals at the San Diego Zoo. As Frances Goland, who is our lead vet, she said we had to try. And it was a really difficult situation because we knew about these three different species, and they were all really different. Harbor porpoise, which are seemingly the closest to vaquita because they live in shallow habitat, they avoid vessels. Um, their response to capture is okay, and they've lived and bred in enclosures okay. So we were hoping they were like harbor porpoise. At the other end, you have dolls porpoise that are uh, live in really deep waters. Um, they have no problems with vessels. They actually approach vessels. Um, but if you capture them, they stress out and they just have to be immediately released. And we didn't know what paquitas were going to be like. And unfortunately, they turned out to be more like doll's porpoise um, than harbor porpoise. So the recovery team uh, met very rapidly in December to discuss what they could do next. Um, and really, the only options that were left to us were to uh, basically increase enforcement and increase the efforts to race against the Totoaba fishermen by retrieving as many nets as possible. So we, uh, that area that's in dark purple is the area where the little red dots are uh, where nets have been pulled out in the past. Um, the filled in circles show the vaquita densities and basically the vaquitas that were remaining were ba basically all in that area that's in dark purple. So we asked the government of Mexico and the Navy to really focus on, you know, just focus on that spot and, and try to, to, you know, boost enforcement and then get as many nets out as we possibly could. <clears throat> but I went out there last March, um, and there are three vessels now uh, all pulling nets, um, and they uh, send the nets off to uh, a company called Parlay that recycles them in very expensive tennis shoes. Um, and the, the shocking thing is that in the bottom there, in the circles, you see all of those anchors. That's seven days worth of ret retrieval last year in March. So that's uh, definitely not showing that there's um, adequate enforcement. <clears throat> And in fact, by the end of the season, they had pulled 400 nets. Um, you can see all of those dots are uh, active Totuala nets. And so that's a very uh, <clears throat> bad statistic um, as far as vaquitas are concerned, because that's right in the area where we know the last vaquitas are, are living. And they also found uh, one dead vaquita, uh, an adult female. So, 
what can we learn from this horrible situation? Well, I think that we had, unfortunately, unrealistic expectations. It takes a really long time to change human behavior, and it was probably always longer than Makita's had, even at that 8% per year decline of, uh, with, with the legal fishing. It was probably never realistic to expect the fisheries agency in Mexico, Conapesca and Inapesca, to develop alternative fishing methods and transition them into the communities. And they have a monopoly when it comes to doing that. The other thing is that we knew that corruption was a very serious issue, um, but we didn't have any way to deal with it or, or account for it. And we put all of our eggs in one basket. We were so afraid of hindering efforts to, per to permanently remove gill nets, which was our plan A, that we were afraid of even exploring plan B, um, figuring out how to take Paquitas into captivity. And we'll never know whether they could have been saved by captive options, because really, we needed to start all the way back in 1997 when there were hundreds of Paquitas, um, and there were no funds to do that, and there was really no support to do that. <clears throat> the other important lesson is that we didn't really account for the unexpected. We were still thinking in that terms of 8% per year, and when that 40, 50% per year happened, um, you know, there was really, you know, the, the sand was running through the hourglass so quickly that, you know, it was almost impossible. To, to deal with a situation like that. And yet, we have to learn from that. I mean, the same thing happened to Baiji, same thing happened to Paquita. When you've got a critically endangered species, um, the collapse can happen from unexpected sources very rapidly. So <clears throat> we've been really um, thinking hard about what, what we should do in the future, um, both for Paquita and for other small cetaceans that are in the same situation. So I've been working at cultivating what I call pragmatic optimism. Um, in conservation, if we lose optimism, it is a self-fulfilling prophecy. If I went to the government of Mexico and I told them that the situation was hopeless, um, that would be a self-fulfilling prophecy. There would be no support then to change what people are doing, which is a very difficult and costly thing to do. On the other hand, if you're excessively optimistic, that's also really risky. You, your actions may not be strong enough, um, and you may have insufficient <coughs> options that are ready. So we've been doing a lot of thinking about what should conservation of some small cetaceans that are constrained to live adjacent to humans be prepared for. And two threats, I, I actually do all the listing for um, cetaceans, whales, dolphins, and porpoises for the IUCN red list. And we never list as a threat poverty and corruption. And yet, I think that these are really major issues that conservationists have to be thinking of. Gill netting and habitat alteration and destruction are most difficult to solve when the people that depend upon them and, and that's a really important thing to just come to grips with. And actions to change human behavior are really difficult to implement if corruption is an issue. So I started, you know, just going to the web and learning about, you know, the animals that are also endangered or critically endangered on the IUCN red list and what is the state of the human cultures that surround those animals. And so we just held a workshop in Nuremberg, Germany in December um, to consider how we would go about revising our conservation strategies for these species that you see here that are all suffering from what I call human proximity vulnerability. They have constrained distributions, low population growth rates, and relatively low abundance. So they're very vulnerable. So this is a... Uh, a multi-dimensional poverty index, um, and I won't have any time to go into details, but the countries that are in red are really, really poor. I mean, serious uh, food security issues. And you can see from uh, the top to the bottom, you can't read the countries, but 
the, the countries with that, that are at the very top are the poorest countries, and it goes all the way down. And you can see I put an arrow up where Mexico is. Um, so relative to most of the places where these other small cetaceans live, Mexico is not a, a really poor country. I also looked at a thing that's called the Corruption Perception <laughs> Index. <laughs> and again, red is bad. Um, and, you know, the gold is looking pretty bad. Um, and I, I sort of reversed the scales that it was on the same scale as the Poverty Index. So uh, basically, they ranked uh, countries and then they gave them a corruption score. Um, and you can see uh, that uh, Mexico ranks 123rd out of 176 countries, and it has a corruption score of 70. And then I started comparing that to the other issues with other small cetaceans that we're dealing with. So here you see Makita that only live in one country, which makes it an easier uh, conservation issue to deal with. Um, and it has a poverty index of two, a corruption index of 70. If you look at the Atlantic humpback dolphin, also critically endangered, uh, poverty index is 56.7, which is just shocking. Um, and again, a very high uh, corruption index. And if you look sort of at uh, several of the species we were looking at, you can see that Mexico is actually in the best shape. Um, and that the other ones have a uh, much uh, more severe poverty issues um, and all have basically the same corruption issues. So is there any reason to believe we can change human behavior faster for any species that's threatened by gill netting than we could for paquitas? And, and I should say that of all the threats in the world, gill netting is by far the biggest threat to marine mammals. There's over 600,000 per year that are killed in industrial fisheries. It doesn't even count small type fisheries. So it's an enormous issue globally. And if time is not in our favor, how should we prepare to have a chance to save these species in the coming decades of biodiversity crisis? So I thought I'd take a few moments just to talk about some lessons from terrestrial species um, that have been saved using captive conservation. So all of the species that you see here went extinct in the wild. Um, they were saved through what is called ex situ conservation, which is uh, Another word for it is captivity, but ex situ actually involves any case where you've taken animals out of their wild habitat and put them someplace else. So, uh, for example, if we had been successful in cap capturing the, the baiji and putting it in these oxbow lakes, that would be ex situ conservation. But the, an the animals would have been, you know, feeding on their own and swimming around, and it wouldn't be like putting them in an aquarium. So it's a whole range. X C2 isn't just putting animals in an aquarium. It's a whole range of options. But they all involve taking the animals out of their dangerous um, wild habitat. So all of these animals, I, I find this really inspiring. That was their lowest number. Um, and all of these animals have been recovered and reintroduced into the wild. Um, which is, is saying a lot um, about what can actually be done if you really understand the biology and you can really um, get in there and, and help these species. The problem for cetaceans is we don't, we're so far behind um, where we are with terrestrial mammals. Um, we need to learn basic husbandry. Um, we have the potential to learn how, we need to have the potential to be able to release them back into the wild, which is always a really difficult step. Even for condors, it's a really difficult step. Um, and we need to, meanwhile, be able to maintain a viable population despite their really low population growth potential, which is lower than, you can't, you can't multiple clutch of a keto. <laughs> Sad but true. So we need to develop the right tools, um, and we don't really have them yet. If we don't develop more tools, we're just less likely to be successful. And not all tools will 
suit all cases. So we need to make some really wise choices. And we know that this type of conservation is going to be really expensive for cetaceans. And so we need to be able to convince people to start funding these efforts before it's an absolute emergency. Because if you wait until it's an emergency, it's probably too late. Um, and then we have really struggled with this problem of the same issue that we struggled with on the conservation uh, of the KETA uh, team was we're so afraid of actually stopping have, having efforts in the wild if you take any animals into captivity. And so we had this meeting to discuss, you know, how are we going to persuade scientists, the public, governments, that this type of conservation has to be part of a larger plan that deals with eliminating threats in the wild. That it isn't an either or that it's both together. And fortunately, um, the IUCN and the zoo community have already come up with what they call the one plan approach, um, which integrates both in the wild, in situ, and out of the wild, ex situ, together as a part of a much bigger plan that includes both of them. And everyone at this workshop uh, really endorsed that this is, this is where we have to start, you know, start moving in that direction. <clears throat> so I'll, I'll leave you with my pragmatic optimism that we need to convey faith in the resilience of the animals if they're given a decent chance. But right now they're not being given a decent chance. And we have to be really practical about the ticking clock and the need for plans that allow for change in human activities to take longer than the animals have. So we have to be practical practical about how long it may take to make ex situ conservation a real t tool for small cetaceans so that we have more tools in our, in our toolbox. So I'm going to return to Vikita with my last slide and tell you something that gives me some reason for hope. So we went out in uh, September um, and we went right up to where we've seen Vikitas before and within 10 kilometers of where that first vaquita calf was captured. We photographed that pair that you see on the bottom, and it's the same mom. So she had the calf in last October, and then she had another calf this September, which is means that they can reproduce basically twice as fast as we thought they could. So that's really exciting. We saw at least eight animals. We saw two very healthy, fat, robust calves. Um, and the other thing that gives me some hope is that these remaining vaquitas, they're all staying in one area. So we have our acoustic monitoring. They're hanging together as a bunch. Um, and I think that makes you know being able to get out there and guard them um, much more doable. We can monitor them with acoustics, um, and we can focus on guarding those last vaquitas and just keeping that one area, which is a pretty small area. You know, if there was just a Mexican Navy ship that plunked its anchor there and guarded the Sea Shepherd boats, and they were out there pulling nets in that area, I think we can give these last individuals a fighting chance. Thank you.